as well. And science might have a prominent role to play in filling those gaps. So here we are, this webinar is about that. Is a, is, is the, aim, the aim is to give an assessment of the two strategies from uh, uh, various perspective, uh, the, the perspectives of farmers and scientists coming from various backgrounds. Um, and hopefully we will start contributing to fill some of those gaps, uh, knowledge gaps that uh, stays between the farm and the fork. Um, before starting, uh, we'd like to, to launch a poll uh, to have a, a grasp of uh, what our audience is thinking of one of the most, of the main elements of the strategies, actually the most discussed one, uh, the targets. As, as you probably know, um, the strategies provide um, some targets at the EU level. Oh, okay, we, we, you can see now already the, the, the multiple option question. Um, we, we would like to know, um, in your view, which of the targets of farm to fork and biodiversity strategy will be the most challenging to achieve? And we will repeat this exercise again at the end of the panel, uh, of the webinar, sorry, so that we uh, can see uh, if uh, the presentations given have changed the, the perception of, of, of those targets. So I will, um, so let's give, uh, let's give up to one minute maybe to, Okay, let's, let's give up to one minute and then we will end the poll and share the results. Okay, the poll is over. So we have 25% organic uh, utilized, agriculture, utilized agriculture area is 15%. Uh, uh, the 50% uh, reduction in, in the plant production products risk and use is 69%. Uh, the reduction in sales of antimicrobials is 4%. And the reduction in nutri nutrient loss, that means uh, probably uh, the reduction in, 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 in the use of fertilizer, a 20% reduction in use of fertilizers, uh, it's 12%. I remember that those, those are targets 20 to 30 targets at European level. So, um, shall we start with the presentation now? I think it's, it's uh, now is the time. Um, I'll, um, we, as, as Jose Maria already said, uh, these, uh, these, um, uh, webinar is, is being recorded because of, of, uh, too many participants, uh, asking for, uh, taking part into it. Um, and the Q&A session that we will have various Q&A sessions um, uh, uh, will be managed like, like, like it follows. Uh, the reference is always uh, Jose Maria uh, Castilla, so the host Asaka National, and uh, um, send send him the questions uh, on on uh, 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 privately, and then he will manage the traffic and 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 um, and we will ask the questions to the to the panel to the panelists. Um, let's start with the, with the, the presentations. The, um, the first one is, is a, let's say, it's a talk rather than a presentation. And, and uh, the first one um, to, 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 to speak is Max Schulman. Max Schulman will open the webinar um, with a talk uh, with the title, Putting the EU 2030 Strategies in Context, Farmers' Challenges and Trade offs. Please, uh, Max Schumann, the, the floor is yours. Thank you, Angelo, and uh, good day or good morning also from my side. Uh, sorry, I will not have any presentation. I was actually thinking about having this speech from the middle of the field, but since we have a little bit of a bad weather today here in Finland, where I'm located, I could not do it. So now I'm sitting here inside the farm in the office, I'm gonna to talk to you and tell you a little bit about how I, as a farmer, look at the policies that were just presented a few weeks ago 
in Brussels and how it might affect me, but also all my colleagues all around Europe. These are big things when you come in with policies that we have just all of us most probably read. People know what the Green Deal as a whole looks, and now we have the Farm to Fork presented to us, also the biodiversity strategy with quite heavy reductions, for instance, in PPPs and also in fertilizers, but also we see that there are big changes coming also in, in the production in the way how we produce. For instance, 25% of the land mass under production in Europe should be converted into organic. It's a big deal. It's a really big deal. What I can tell you is one thing. We as farmers, we for sure depend a lot on many things. Some of them are out of our hands, like the weather. Some of them are more and more out of our hands, like the policies and the politics. And then for sure, we have things that we can handle, at least somewhat. And that means that we can plant the crops we feel that we'll find a way into the market that year. We can also nurture them so that they will grow up, so we can fertilize them. We can also take care of them through plant protection. If we are talking about herbicides, if we are talking about fungicides or pesticides, we have these tools in our hands. And we in EU are very well suited for this. I mean, just look at Europe. We have been able in a quite a long time already been able to stay self-sufficient in the food sector. We have been able to produce enough food for all the EU citizens for many, many decades already. Now what I'm seeing is that if we go too fast and too far with the policies as they have been presented today, we might even jeopardize it. And here I think that there is a lot of things that the citizens and the consumers might not really see and understand and know. For instance, if we go and put less fertilizers on the fields, it will right away decrease the productivity there. I mean, we will have less yields. That's a fact. We all need food. If we don't get food, we don't grow. That's one thing. What happens then? We try for sure to stay healthy as well, to be able to grow and be able to stay hard and strong against diseases. So then we also take care of the surroundings. That means that we take care of with herbicides, that there are not any other plants that are competing with the plants that have been planted into the fields so that we actually can get a crop out of it and that they can get the right amount of water to the real plants that actually will produce the yield, will produce the food, the feed, the fuel, the energy, what is needed for our citizens, for our animals, and also to fulfill other tasks inside the society. So we need these tools to be able to do it. And until now, we have been able to have these tools in our toolbox. We have been able to use them when they are needed. We have been monitoring as we all farmers do. We monitor, we see, and we use them only when needed. This is something that we have been doing for already decades. It is not so that you just go out and take something from the shelf and say, okay, I'll go out and do some spraying today. This is not the case. It's a hard job. It's also a cost. You have to imagine that we are part, not only of our own member state market, we are part of the European market. We are also part of the world market. We get from there the signals in price, but we also get from there the signals of quality that is needed to be traded. Now we come back to the thing. We have quantity and quality that we are working on as farmers. For us to be able to have our income, we need for sure to be able to have quality and quantity. Firstly, quantity, but then we also have to match the quality standards that are set by the trade, by the industry. It is not something that we as farmers have set or the weather has set. If it is so that we have bad weather events that we cannot really cope with, we might experience bad quality in some parts of Europe. Now when we can make sure that we can grow fully all over Europe as we have been able to do today, we will always have a secure supply of food coming in to the European market. Part of it can also find its way outside Europe. So we are also contributing as the big area of Europe into the world food supply. 
Now when we start cutting in use of pesticides and fertilizers, we are jeopardizing not only our own self-sufficiency, but we are also jeopardizing part of the world food supply at the same time. These things cannot be done just in a flick of a finger. From today, 2020 to 2030, when all of these should be put in place, should be up and running, it's only 10 years. We do not have too much time. We need to know what we are doing. So we need research. We need research to catch up now, fill the gaps of knowledge that we do not have today. And we need it to be put in place so that we as farmers know that once we go out in the fields in the future with maybe less pesticides, less fertilizers, that we still can achieve safe and affordable food in the quality that will find the market and that will satisfy not only the rest of the chain, but also you, our consumers. So I am quite concerned today when I see how fast these kind of policies are put in place and will be put then in action. We need time to react. As we also need as farmers time to cope with the change that is happening already today around us with the climate ever changing. So what we really need is sound and hard research. We need the science to be part of our farming activities as always. They have always been part of it. If you need to put less fertilizer, less plant protection, we need to make sure that we have also stronger varieties. We need a very good plant breeding program in Europe as a whole to make sure that we can find plants that can be resilient against climate change, but also strong enough to cope with pests, new diseases, and maybe even fight off some of the weeds that we have. At the same time, we will be able to achieve the goals. For instance, one big thing that we have today is we are good in cereals. We have maybe lost a little bit the touch on our protein sources nice and good plants. You will hear more about them today. They will also be there in our toolbox to do. But for us to pick them up as farmers, we need them to be able to compete with the yields of our cereals. Meaning we need, again, plant breeding to step in, to help us to catch this gap. So whatever you do, whenever a policy is put in place with reduction, on something, there are always a trade-off. If you reduce the pesticides, you will hit right away the quality. If you reduce fertilizers, you will hit both the quantity and the quality. So the thing is that it is not so simple and easy just to say, let's reduce. We have been able to feed Europe through the whole COVID-19. Well, we have worked hard. We have not stopped at all. So we can say that we know what we do. And I also hope that the citizens, the politicians, the consumers also would trust in the farming sector more than what you do today. Because sometimes as a farmer, you really feel squeezed into a corner when you are put into the place when everybody is saying you are the ones that are the bad guys on the block. Even if we are doing the best what we can to feed you during crises and outside them. I hope this has opened a little bit now for you how the farmers think. You just have to imagine one more thing. We live out of the fields. We live out of the crops that we produce. We are using the land as our main production source. We do not either want to jeopardize the land that are surrounding us, that are our production force at all. We try to make it even better, try to make sure that we can pass it on to the next generation in even better shape. But we also need to make sure that the next generation is interested to take over. That means that we also need to have a farm income coming out of it so that we can get the next generation or the new farmers to take over, to continue our work, important work. But also at the same time, we need to have a farm income of the farmers today so we can invest in new, maybe better technologies that will come in the future through the science approach. That's what we are really looking forward to have. We want to stay there in the race still tomorrow. Thank you. Well, thank you. Thank you to Max Schumann. Uh, the, the, because the timing was perfect, but you all, um, also because of the experience you have talked about. Um, I, 
Hello? Yes, we can hear you. Yes, okay. It's working. It's working. Yeah, uh, it's, um, I forgot to, to actually, I, 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 sorry, I apologize. Max Schumann is, 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 a, is, a, is a farmer, is a Finnish farmer, but he's also a, a degree in agricultural economics, worked as grain trader and in agricultural machinery sector and um, traveling all over the world. He chaired the serial working group in Copacogica from 2013 to 2019 and is currently advisor at the Finnish Central Union of Agricultural Producers and Forest Owners, MTT. So, for, uh, we have five minutes for the, uh, um, for the question and answer session. Uh, I remind everybody that the point of reference for the question is Asaka Nacional. Uh, you should send the question to um, Jose Maria Castilla, Asaka Nacional. And, uh, um, and then he will manage the questions. We have one already. Uh, a question to Max Schulman is from uh, Immaculada Leon uh, from Asaka. Uh, do you think uh, th that all the targets proposed by 2030 is a realistic date. You have talked, Max, we have talked about the, 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 the speed of this, the acceleration of this, uh, of this uh, uh, movement. Do you think that uh, all this, given that the, the, say, the strive for reducing the use of some inputs is also something that is convenient for the farmers because they are a cost, in a sense, economic cost. But, uh, is this realistic? Uh, is it realistic to to achieve all this by 2030? This is the question of uh, Immaculada Leon. A very good question. I have been thinking about it myself, and I have been looking at the policies uh, proposed. And we also know that there will be a few more coming in here. The further we go, I think the main thing should be first to look at these proposed policies altogether. Now they are looked at one bit, like farm to fork is its own biodiversity as its own, they should be combined. And we should look then at what can really be achieved once we are putting all of these together. I think some bits and pieces can be achieved, yes. But I also know that there are some of the things already proposed today that will be very, very difficult to achieve. At least if we would like to be able to, for instance, maintain a good market price. I would just pick one thing, 25% organic of the land mass of European production land. We are down today around 7, 8%. What will happen with the market when it comes to 25% of the land mass will be under organic production? How much at that point will we, during the time when this is going on, we have unproductive land for quite a while, at least three years. How much will it then affect also the overall, for instance, cereals, oil seeds and protein crop supply to the European Union. I think that here we have to stop and think, do we really need to rush or do we do it more slowly? So to the answer to the question is some can be achieved, it will be tough. And some, in my opinion, should not even be tried to be achieved by 2030. So I would rather myself set the target to 2050, give the time to all the ones in the chain to adapt because it's not only the farmers that has to adapt. If we have lower quality and less of different types of grains, also the industry has to be able to change, also the consumers has to change, and the consumers also will end up paying most probably a little bit more for the food. So I think that there is an adaption period for all of us. Thank you. Thank you, Max. If I may add one question, actually, because the, the, the acceleration is important, but one of the reasons behind these accelerations is also, this is, the, this is the point of view of the Commission, this is the point of view of many stakeholders, is also that the, the changes are accelerating themselves. Climate change are accelerating, uh, environmental changes are accelerating. What do you think about that? I have been a farmer since 1986. And uh, that's, you know, 30 some years already, meaning that they're already during this period, I have seen just on my own farm, through my own eyes, already changes in the climate back and forth, even in such a short period of time as three decades. Yes, I can see that it is accelerating in some, some ways, 
but at the same time also we see that it is slowing down in other ways so uh, for sure we have to be able to keep up and that's why we need the research side now to kick in for many decades many member states and also eu-wide we have been seeing that there is less and less funding coming into basic research now we would really need it to make sure that we have the base there so that we can start to work at the forefront with the new innovative things that actually will help us farmers to cope with this faster and faster ongoing if it is climate change change in the weather patterns etc what we are you know feeling today at the same time we also need to cope with other things we have more and more mouths to feed we might have more and more of uh, pandemics like covid to make sure that we have a supply chain of food that stretches all over the world we also have to take care of these so you have to not only look at the world west the weather but also look at everything around you we need research and at that stage and we need the science we cannot disconnect okay thanks 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 Max. that's 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 a good answer i mean uh, um if the, the issues are accelerating, let's try to accelerate the, the, the knowledge uh, and, and, and uh, the interconnection uh, among different uh, uh, stakeholders in knowledge. Uh, we have seen that with also, also with many um, uh, new pathogens in, in, in coming from, uh, uh, from, uh, from abroad, I mean, from non EU countries. The first thing to do is talk to the scientists that are dealing with them in no, in the countries they were that they are they, they are coming from thank you um, uh thank you to max schulman and now we will uh, move to the, the the other presentations to a group of two we will have two presentations in a row um i remember for the question and answer um i i already told that but i will tell this many many, 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 many more times um uh, the point of reference is uh, uh, Jose Maria Castilla, Asaka Nacional. Uh, he will manage the question and uh, send, send, uh, send him the questions. He will send the questions to me. Um, and um, uh, now we will have two presentations already and then, and then uh, a 10 minutes Q&A session. Uh, the first pr presentation in this uh, um, in this group of, uh, of presentations is from Pedro Gallardo that I see on the screen. Good morning, Pedro. Uh, Pedro is a farmer from Puerto Real, Andalusia, uh, and uh, after finishing his studies in business administration at the University of Cadiz, he joined the family farm in 1996. He is currently vice president of the Spanish Farmers Organization Asaja and chair of the working group on protein crops at the Copa Cugica. Mr. Gallardo, you have the floor. Thank you very much, Angelo. Thank you very much for, for the invitation. Uh, and, and thank you for all the information about me and farming, etc. Okay, I'm going to, 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 to have a presentation I would like to, to share. Uh, uh, this presentation, uh, I think I have 10 minutes, okay, okay. Yes, ten minutes. Ten minutes. Okay. Okay. The title of my presentation and is. I uh, have I have this in case you you are running out of time. Okay. Europe farming after COVID. Uh, what is the uh, important solution, etc. Okay. First, we have to say that during the pandemic, farmers don't stop. We have many examples that we we were working because we need to to have enough supply in the supermarket. So the supermarket, the citizen, have a different perception before the pandemic and, and after the pandemic. This is something that we, we, we should talk. Or more, moreover, because we have uh, disinfection, also the cities, the, the, the towns, we will work hard for that to, to help the, the citizen. And one consideration important is the, what is going to happen in next year in, in the world, because this is something that the commission should take uh, important. We, we are going to have less arable land, uh, climate change, less water, more population. And uh, in arable land, for example, we should compare what's happening before and the future. We have 11% more land arable in the world, but it's true that Europe has lost 27% uh, land, arable land, uh, and, the, and the arable land is growing in the, in the south. 
Brazil, 200%, Argentina, uh, Malaysia, uh, Australia, Indonesia, etc. So we need to, to, to feed the population. United Nations said that we are going to grow till uh, 2000, uh, 2000, uh, 2000, 2100, we are going to, to continue growing. This is uh, the, the next growing, the, the percentage of the growing population. And we need to, to feed this population. And especially, it's important what is going to happen in Africa. Africa right now has uh, 1,300 1, million persons, and Africa is going to have, to have more than 4,500 uh, 4, million of population. So we need to, to feed population, not only in Europe. We need to, 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 uh, to be solidarity with the, another countries or continent like Africa. About cereals, Europe is losing uh, the competitiveness. In last uh, years, about you have the uh, the export uh, and below you have the import and in Syria we are losing and losing and losing last year we are uh, right now in, in neutral so uh, we are uh, producing less and less in Europe and about the strategies and the uh, European Green Deal uh, on the 20th of May we have the presentation but I miss our commissioner uh, uh, the commissioner uh, Kiriakidis from from health and, and food safety was there. Also, Sinkevicius from uh, environmental and Timmermans. But we didn't see our commissioner, and he should, he should be there for the for to, to defend the, the sector. Uh, another thing uh, in the presentation: farm to for strategy and biodiversity. We we could read is for a fair health environmental friendly food system. I ask myself, fair, healthy, and environmental friendly? Why? Because first, we didn't see any uh, impact assessment. The commission didn't present how it's going to, to take influences in our, in our business, in farming business. So we missed this. And also, we have the, the uh, controversy. The commission said that uh, the agriculture is the major uh, system in the world to reduce greenhouse. In fact, we have reduced 20% since 1994. But on the other side, the commission said that we need to reduce pesticides, antimicrobials, etc. The, the limitation that they, they want they present is uh, to reduce, like you said before, 50% the chemical pesticide, 20%, at least the 20% uh, nutrients, microbial, organic, they want to set up 25% uh, organic farming. And first, we, are, we, don't, we don't share, we, we don't agree with this. First, because we don't understand why this percentage. Second, the impact assessment was not uh, present. So uh, for us, uh, it's something that we, we don't accept. Then uh, you, everybody knows that uh, uh, you, uh, farming, Europe farming needs e uh, protein. A protein here, uh, this is a DGRA uh, chart. We, we are producing uh, three, almost three million tons of uh, soybean, uh, but we import almost 15 million uh, tons of protein soybean. So Europe is only producing 17%. We import the 83. And this strategy is going to produce to be more dependent from the, uh, uh, from the sector, external sector. And one more thing, the Green Deal uh, tried to, to give us a, a green Europe, more green, OK? But if we, we make this, we are going to, to, to move the green food to another countries, especially to Africa and South America. So this is important because, OK, we are going to have a limitation in Europe, but uh, our networks and other countries, uh, another farming is going not to have this limitation. So this is something that we are really, really against. Uh, population is, is growing, like we said before, and we said many times, uh, uh, we need tools. We, need, we are going to have a, a climate change in the future, of course, but we need to, to, to defend. And we said many times that Europe is a laboratory, and in fact, 
the southern countries like Spain, Portugal, Italy, Greece, is a laboratory for future pests because we have more temperature and we are uh, border with uh, Africa, etc. And if a, a future pest will enter in Europe, the pest will enter in the south, not enter in the Scandinavia or um, Holland. For sure, it will enter for, from here. So we, we, I finish now for a question. Um, just to one, one consideration. We are proud to contribute to the food safe, uh, serenity, but we need tools to continue producing. We, may, we are producing more with less because, because of our actual CAP, but we cannot uh, produce more with less in the future. If they want to produce uh, less, we need more, of course, we need more, more and more budget in our farming. Thank you. Thank you, Pedro Gagliardo. I, um, I will move to the second presentation of this group of presentations. I remind that uh, there will be a, a 10 minutes Q&A sessions after the presentation of Deborah Piovan and uh, that I, uh, hello Deborah, um, uh, that is the, the next speaker. Um, there are already two questions in, in, in the queue. So uh, Deborah um, will talk to us of the uh, EU strategies and the crop protein deficit in Europe. Uh, graduated in agricultural sciences in 1994, Deborah Piovan runs the family farm together with her sisters. Um, uh, she is president of the National Federation of Protein and Oil Crops at the Italian Farmers Organization Confagricoltura, and she is engaged in many initiatives uh, for the communication and dissemination of innovation in agriculture. Uh, Deborah Piovan, you have the floor, please. Okay, thank you very much. And Thank you, Angela, and good morning, everybody. Um, thank you for the invitation. I think it is um, a good thing that the European Commission is uh, working on a comprehensive vision of, of farming, of agriculture, the food system, and its impact on the environment uh, as a roadmap towards the Green Deal. Farmers will necessarily be involved in it as they will be um, actors of any vision regarding uh, food production. So we expect to be engaged in the discussion, not just impacted by the conclusions. What we mean is that the strategies should be inclusive and the voice of farmers um, fully considered. So again, I thank you for the invitation today. Let, let, let me uh, share my screen and my presentation. There. Um, so my objective today is uh, to discuss the uh, expected, uh, expected consequences on competitiveness, on self-sufficiency, on food security, and on the environment, focusing in particular on protein crops. Now, the European Commission issued a report on November 2018 on the development of plant proteins in the uh, European Union, and uh, as a consequence, member states are, are discussing and implementing national plant protein plans. The goal is to improve self-sufficiency of vegetable proteins in the union, to analyze the supply demand situation, and ultimately, and I quote, calling for European, a European strategy to promote European protein crops. As stated in the report adopted by the European Parliament in April 2018, we use uh, protein crops for feed as their meals are an important source of uh, uh, protein for livestock and the oil has industrial uses biodiesel for example so the two outlet markets feed and biodiesel influence each other i mention this because we have uh, recently witnessed a decline in uh, biofuels demand due to low oil prices as a consequence of the covid outbreak and this impacts protein crops, as they are protein and oil crops, as I mentioned. Uh, the result could be a lower supply of, uh, of, of protein uh, uh, for feed, or some processing plants are actually closing. Um, 
a smaller percentage of the uh, production is for food. There is a growing food market for uh, vegetable proteins for human consumption, which is growing steadily. The fact that the European soya is uh, necessarily GM-free represents apparently a premium for final consumers and customers, but uh, only 6% of the uh, global trade in uh, soya is um, GM-free, 9, 9 million tons approximately. Um, this graph shows uh, how heavily the European Union depends on imports to fulfill the demand of vegetable uh, proteins, soya in particular. We import 17 million tons of uh, uh, crude proteins each year. This is because the EU self-sufficiency rate is 79% um, for rapeseed, uh, Pedro mentioned it, it earlier, 42% for sunflower, and only 5% for, um, for soya. Um, this graph tells us that imports are in fact uh, growing. Um, the European Union is currently investing in research and innovation programs to um, improve protein crops, breeding, biotic and abiotic stresses tolerance, uh, use diversification, uh, and in general on transition paths to, paths to um, sustainable and competitive protein crops and value chains. Um, through several policy instruments, the EU and the member states support protein crops because um, they recognize the benefits uh, both from the environment and the economy. Um, inside this picture that I have tried to frame, farmers move and make decisions, but most of all they try to answer the several challenges they face and that have been mentioned earlier climate change and new pests that endanger our crops, a growing population to feed. And we uh, uh, keep working following, let me remind you, the strictest body of regulations in the world. The food we produce is safe, as the EFSA reports tell us each year. Uh, this is the last one available. 99.2% available, of the samples were perfectly regular. And also regarding multi-residue, the recent EFSA opinion is there's no risk and they'll keep studying and checking on that, of course, which is good. Also, there is a recent uh, Danish study that tells us that the risk related to pesticides intake of food is the same as that related to drinking one glass of wine every three months. One glass every three months. This means that the risk perception in consumers regarding pesticides is very far from, uh, um, from reality. Um, coming to the strategies the Commission is considering, we expect any discussion on the issue to, base, to be based on, on facts without any ideological preconception that might hide or prevent us from uh, adopting useful solutions or, or uh, conceal useful approaches because the decisions made will impact farmers' competitiveness, self-sufficiency, food security, and the environment. The example of protein crops serves the purpose to show the danger of, of a low, too low quota of self-sufficiency in the EU, and how to reduce, uh, reduce this access to tools for protection uh, further endangers it. Uh, for example, Several studies have been published on the environmental impact of certain farming methods like organic farming, which are an interesting source of income for farmers as they help satisfy a niche market. But to expect the European farmers to move from the actual 7.5% of organic farmland, most of which is pasture, to 25% in 10 years is um, a dangerous message for several reasons. It would endanger European self-sufficiency. It would increase import on uh, um, dependence on, on imported food produced in other countries. It would stimulate the deforestation in those countries. 
um, it would put European consumers in, in competition with consumers in poorer countries. It would increase greenhouse gases emissions, both for production and, and for shipping. What I mean is that organic and conventional can and should coexist in order also to ensure free choice, both for consumers and for, for farmers. But to rely on organic to feed the Europeans is a scientifically proven risk for the environment, for biodiversity, and for self-sufficiency, so for the economy. So we suggest to look to innovation as an accelerator of the transition towards a more sustainable food system. As far as plant production products are concerned, um, farmers have already gone a great way in making their products and their work safe for consumers and for the environment and in reducing their footprint. Mm, since 1993, and thanks to a strict European revision of the active principles available, 67% um, of the molecules have been withdrawn from the market. 26% have uh, fully passed the revision as soon as better uh, means of protection become available. In short, um, what the recent European Commission strategy proposed um, is already happening, but without protection, more than half of our uh, meals would vanish due to pests, fungal diseases, weeds. Do we need to protect our crops? Well, there's a um, for example, a 2017 study by Be Safe from the Catholic University of Piacenza in Italy that showed that uh, without, we would lose, uh, for example, 67% of uh, apples, 57% of wheat, 81% of tomatoes, 87% of corn, and so on. Um, it is a potential loss of uh, 6.8 billion euros uh, uh, for our exports and of 7.8 to up to 34.8 billion euros for the food value chain depending on the product. Let's not forget that the FAO, the United Nations, declared 2020 the International Year of Plant Health. They estimate that about 40% of food crops are lost every year due to poor protection. Now, this is hard to accept. Uh, it's a great waste and it is, we believe, not ethical to tolerate it. Plant protection products are one tool together with others, including crop breeding, uh, biotechnologies, digitization, integrated pest management and, and, and so on. There's a very recent article published in Nature Food just last May, and I would like you to read this graph with me, um, how to reach sustainable food systems. There are several things we need. Let's read them together. We need to develop transition pathways. We need transforming mindsets. We need an enabling social license. We need changing policies and regulations. We need designing market incentives, and of course, safeguarding against undesirable effects, ensuring stable finance, and we need to build trust. Now, this is one of the direst uh, challenges, that of communication. We see that parts of the consumers have lost their uh, trust in farmers and in the food value chain. They are afraid of what they eat. They see farmers literally as, um, as polluters. But we want to raise awareness, not fear. Our food is safe and the data EFSA publishes every year, uh, for example, on the residues of, on food, prove it. We want to build, rebuild a dialogue with society showing how we work, always following the evidence that uh, uh, science gives us. Um, regarding both agronomy and the uh, environment protection and satisfying the needs of our clients, reminding society that we follow, as I mentioned, the strictest body regulations in the world. But we need constructive stakeholders dialogue, dialogue and clear transition pathways toward uh, a more innovative method of production. We need game-changing approaches. But 
achieving this depends on the economic and political context, on the needs of the society, and on its socio-economic condition. So I believe we are here today to discuss these two, and that, that is why meetings like this are so valuable. So societal dialogue is of the utmost importance. Um, so in conclusion, we hope that the targets, the targets we set are based on science and evidence in order to find proper solutions, and that the voice of farmers is considered as we are those who have been providing safe and affordable food to the population also during the COVID outbreak. Thank you. Thank you, Deborah Piovan, for your presentation and uh, for all the all the all the beef that you put on on the table. It's very uh, from from facts to perception. It's it's it, it was very interesting presentation. Uh, I would uh, move to the Q and A session. Uh, we have um, uh, three questions, I think, already. Um, I had I had I experienced some some uh, uh, issues with the with, with the connection, so I'm retrieving the questions. Um, so um, can I ask which pesticide? I asked this I asked this question to both of you because you are both of farmers. Uh, can I ask which pesticide herbicide were um, used uh, has now been limited or banned? has had the most impact on your farm? This is from Wendy Harwood. Uh, did, you, did you experience, a, 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 um, let's say, the, the limitation of, uh, in the use of some herbicides or uh, uh, pesticides, and, and you can say what is the impact on, 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 on uh, your activity? Yeah, I can answer, Pedro. Man. Um, there are several active principles that we still can use. Several others have been banished. The result is that we have uh, safer molecules, and but we can also use less uh, active principle because we have mm, better equipment and we use um, digitization also to focus uh, on and clearly um, treat when it's uh, the best time and when it's needed. This helps us use less active principle. Uh, we, we strive to fight uh, weeds with the ones we have left and we hope uh, no more banishing uh, uh, limits our work because it's, uh, it's already difficult to control weeds which are very, very resilient and very um, aggressive uh, towards our crops. Pedro. Yes. Uh, uh, well, uh, uh, there is many, many uh, active material that uh, we, we use in the farm, and, and we think that uh, citizens should know that these uh, these products are expensive. Uh, in fact, in, in our in our in our account, uh, we, we try to to limit. Uh, Maximum because we don't we don't spray more than we need. Uh, so we we are reducing in last year, but at least we need to have uh, tools in our farm. We lose the neonicotinoid, and Europe is the only place in the world that we don't have neonicotinoid. Now we have problem in maize, uh, corn, and then we have also uh, limitation in crop glyphos. Uh, of course, everybody is using glyphosate in the farming because it's uh, one of the most uh, cheaper, uh, cheapest uh, herbicide. But of course, we continue, we need a fungicide because it's very important for the future pest. So we we are also reducing. So and this is an impact on 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 your activity. Uh, could you could you see this impact uh, in happening? This is Yes, for example, when we lose the neonicotinoids, we, here in the south of Spain, we need to supply more seed than the normal. We need to, to, to add 20% 20, 20 more seed to the, to the ground because we are going to lose a high percentage of the seed. So this is a consequence to lose one tool that it was 
demonstrate that works. But okay, it was money. Then we need to, to apply maybe could be like 30 euros more per hectare because we need to, to add more seed. Thanks, Can Pedro. something, Angela? Yeah. Yes, of course. In my personal experience and my colleagues, one of the most difficult thing to control is um, fungal diseases. Uh, we used to have molecules very, very efficient and most of them have been vanished. So um, we do look to research and innovation and I must say to biotechnologies with very great hope to help us control fungal diseases in our crops. That's one of the most difficult things to control. Thank you, Deborah. I, I have two questions, one each. Um, one is from Alex, uh, uh, Alex Creek, that is uh, the Deputy President of SIBE, uh, uh, the International Confederation of European Breed Growers, that uh, asks uh, uh, how can the targets of 50% uh, uh, pesticide use reduction be squared with the objectives of the new CAP like increasing competitiveness and efficiency. I find it hard. Oh, sorry. Pedro, sorry. Okay. Uh, thank you, Alex, for the for the question. Uh, I think this is the key. The key. Uh, we didn't see, as I said before, we didn't see a, a impact assessment. Uh, there is a limitation in our production capacity, of course. And, and we didn't see the impact assessment from the Commission. Uh, we consider that we can't establish percentage, for example, 25% uh, organic. Uh, why? Some farmers maybe will make 100%, and some farmers can't do anything because it's very difficult to make a organic farming and have profitable in some areas. So we think. Uh, the farmers uh, can make more to the market, of course. The market will say uh, what is what we need to do, but of course we need freedom for choice. We, we could customer, consumers uh, have uh, should have the possibility for uh, freedom for choice, and the same way farmers need to to adapt the farming business model to uh, uh, freedom for choice. Maybe we can make uh, organic, uh, conventional, or by car. But we need this uh, freedom for, for choice. So it's a demand-driven uh, situation, you say. It's, it depends on the demand of the consumers. Uh, Deborah, you were, you, will, you were saying something? Yes, thank you. Um, that's, a, that's a fair question. Why reduce... So talk about um, pesticides or agrochemicals, for example, they asked for a redu reduction of 50%. Why? On what basis? Why talk about plant protection products as a whole? It makes no scientific, uh, scientific po point of view. It has no meaning at all. Let's talk about each single active principle, each single molecule. Why a reduction in general? This, it, this, this is very worrying because I see no evidence behind these decisions and this i admit it worries me a lot because we put our activity our enterprise and our the, our future food in the hands of decisions that show uh, to be based on what this is worrying there's another question, the last one uh, I have for this uh, group of presentations. It's uh, addressed to Deborah, the is from Fabio. The last FAO food outlook stresses that while food markets will face mass, much uncertainty due to, to the COVID-19 in the next months, the agri-food sector is predicted to be more resilient than other sectors. Do you share the same views? Yeah, partly. Um... The food system proved to be very resilient during the last emergency, but that was because our uh, our our grains were were full. We had a full capacity, or almost full, and so we had enough food. What if this had happened a few years ago when we had had low productions? I 
4C, I imagine that several states would have closed their exports and prices would have skyrocketed and that would have been very, very bad for consumers. So we should learn something from the last emergency, this last emergency in the COVID emergency that we lived. We should learn something to help the food chain to be even more resilient and be able to provide safe, affordable food like it can do uh, also in uh, when stressed by emergency situations. It means we have to invest in um, logistics, in safe production, in innovation, in the crop, and, uh, and uh, later in the food change after that. Um, let's not take it for granted that the food chain is resilient. When a uh, uh, dire situation um, happens, um, we, we must be strong enough and able to innovate in order to protect our food. Uh, last question. This is re really the last, but I have to ask this to, to you because you are farmers as well. So um, in the next in the next group of presentations, we will have two academics. So this is a question for farmers. I would like to know, according to speakers, this is from Pedro Narro. I would like to know, according to speakers, which elements of the farm to fork strategy can support competitiveness and should be further developed? We are focusing on, on, on some aspects of, on the targets, on, on the constraints, let's say. Uh, what are the opportunities, maybe, if I, if I may translate uh, the, 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 the question? Um, Pedro and Deborah. Yes. Uh, thank you, Pedro, for, for, Pedro Narro, for the question. Uh, uh, the, 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 the main objective that the farmer will really now need now is to, to have incomes in the, in the, in the business. Uh, we, we, we could check after the pandemic, like uh, we were the, in, the, in the cities in strikes because we didn't have price for our crops. After the pandemic, we have worse price than, than before. So, uh, of course, the important thing is to, to increase the income in our farming. And, and these uh, strategies are going to reduce our incomes because we are going to produce less. And the price will be international price because the price at the end is the is the ship who came from uh, Ukraine or Argentina or Canada. This is something that we are demand because, for example, some years ago we, we lose the neonicotinoids. It's the only place in the world that the neonicotinoids are banned. But uh, corn um, and wheat and other production from other countries is coming to uh, to 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 Europe with the neonicotinoids, with this, our production. So, uh, and, and, the city, and the citizen is buying this product with the same price. So this is something that we need to, to, to change. We need more incomes. Um, what, but, but, you know, Pedro, the, the question was, what are the elements in the farm to fork that can give you more income, in a sense? What, what are the opportunities you see in the farm to fork strategy? If I may be more on the question, Pedro. Uh, okay, <laughs> you <laughs> answered. No, no uh, 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 what what we miss we miss a, a point of view about the science criteria from the Commission because they they they, they, they give us some uh, percentage to to reduce the for example, uh, the pesticide, the fungicide, the, to be, uh, for example, 25% or organic. But uh, we didn't see any approach to the criteria, uh, scientific criteria, like, for example, new breeding techniques that could be a tool that farmers could, could need in the, in the future with the climate change. So uh, we see only limitation and we didn't see any, any incomes for the future. Any tool. Okay, Deborah. No, no, it's a very, very, very interesting question. What elements can support competitiveness and should be further developed? Well, I say let's take the chance to promote innovation and restart communication with the society at large. Um, society is asking to, for us to prove that our food is safe and sustainable. We can prove that and we can 
um, uh, invest in innovation, promote research and innovation in order to further always improve our sustainability, both from the environmental and the economic point of view. So I would say, let's take the chance of this farm to fork strategy, strategies discussion to restart dialogue with society together with research and the scientists. Thank you, Deborah. Now I will move to the next group of presentations. Uh, uh, there will be, as, as we have just done, there will be two presentations in a row. Um, after that, there will be a Q&A session um, of almost 10 minutes. Um, the, the procedure for Q&A session is, is working quite smoothly right now. Uh, more and more questions are arriving, but please, I have to remind to all of you, to um, to tell your name and your affiliation when you ask the question. Uh, this is quite uh, this is quite important because we cannot see you. So, <laughs> thanks a lot. And um, um, so the next uh, uh, two presentations, um, the next presentation actually is uh, will be delivered by Professor um, uh, Justus Wessler. And the title is Impact Assessment of the Proposed Targets. Uh, professor Wessler um, is a German agricultural economist, is professor of agricultural economics and chair of the agricultural economics and rural policy group at the Wageningen University. His research, focus, his research work is focused on, on bioeconomy economics and, uh, and uh, economics and policies especially on the impact on new technology and regulations on sustainability in the value chain. Professor Wessler, you have the floor for 10 minutes. Thanks. Yes, thank you uh, very much uh, for the very nice introduction. And I also like to congratulate uh, the organizers for having this seminar, which I think is uh, extremely important. Uh, now I have, uh, let me see, I'd like to share my screen. Yes, okay, this should work. Now can you see my screen, just for yes. confirmation? Okay, yes. thanks yes. a lot. Great. Um, now it has been already uh, mentioned several times how important the farm to fork uh, strategy is and that it is part of the EU Green Deal, the larger so to say, uh, EU initiative on sustainable development. It's linked to the sustainable development goals by the United Nations. It has as some of its mayor um, issues, a contribution to address climate change as well as addressing sustainability issues. And uh, you can see this in the strategy that has been uh, published by the European uh, Commission, how important these two aspects, climate change and sustainability, are with uh, regards to the farm to fork uh, strategy. Now, what I like to stress here is, and that has been also mentioned by the previous speakers, is that we are not living in an isolated world. Right, and this is just illustrated here by the uh, picture on the carbon cycle. Right, carbon is uh, what we call a uh, global uh, pollutant, so to say. It, um, whether the Europeans or the Americans or the Australians or the Indians uh, emit carbon, it affects all of us because it's uh, mixed in, in our atmosphere. What is also important to uh, consider here is that. Basically, the issue with respect to climate change uh, starts with extracting fossil fuels from the, uh, so to say, pedosphere. When we look at the biosphere, right, uh, at that level, carbon or uh, the carbon balances has always been relatively stable over time. So that is very important to take into consideration. Another important aspect is that it is important to consider where carbon basically is accumulating, right? The uh, total amount of carbon basically is fixed on Mother Earth, and the accumulation is something that really generates a problem. And the problem is generated if we have an accumulation of carbon in the atmosphere and not in the pedosphere or in the biosphere. So that's why reducing the accumulation of carbon in the atmosphere is one of the important issues to address 
uh, issues related uh, to uh, climate change. And that then links, for example, to possibilities of accumulating carbon within, for example, the uh, biosphere, which is at this point in time easier than to increase the accumulation in the uh, pedosphere, which takes thousands of years. Now, when we talk about the uh, uh, um, farm to fork strategy and link carbon and sustainability issues, then we have to bear in mind that we have five major trends that we observe within the food supply chains that are challenging uh, how we are consuming and producing food and also challenge uh, carbon dioxide emissions as well as sustainability issues. And these are the five issues. These are uh, clean meat production, which have a lot of positive implications for the environment. These are the developments of meat substitutes. These are the uh, uh, production of um, um, proteins from insects, the uh, increase in aquaculture, and the um, increase in vertical farming and related uh, urban farming uh, production technologies. All these five trends basically have one of, as one of the common uh, denominators that agriculture or food production, not agriculture, but food production is moving towards urban centers. And then we have to ask ourselves to a certain extent what basically is left for, uh, for agriculture. And there um, new opportunities are arising that are not only related to the farm to fork strategy, but to the uh, bioeconomy and the Green Deal in more general. And that is uh, looking beyond the only production for food, but uh, producing other very important components that we need for our daily lives related to uh, the development of the bioeconomy. And if we look at this, we have to bear in mind that many of these developments are related to R&D, and this has already been stressed by the previous speakers. And we have to bear in mind that if we talk about R&D, and in particular R&D within the uh, sector of biotechnologies, that these are not only for the um, bio, um, let's say for the production of uh, primary uh, products, but that we have to look at the whole cycle. It affects industry, health, and other sectors as well. And that leads me then to the uh, next point um, that for um, addressing these issues, uh, we need um, new innovations. And these new innovations, as I'm uh, showed in the previous line are related to many sectors within our economy. And these new innovations have some very key components uh, that are driving them. And that is the investments in R&D, then how we assess and approve those uh, new uh, developments and uh, what kind of markets they, will, uh, they may reach. And then uh, what might be what we call, normally call ex post liabilities. So some uh, implications that may uh, stay beyond the lifetime of the new developments. And what economists have shown for uh, years and argued from for uh, in general is that um, the um, regulation of these new technologies can have a substantial implications on investment in these new technologies. And this, uh, this slide here uh, shows you um, that um, what are the marginal costs of a change in regulatory uh, uh, policies, for example, and they are extremely high, uh, ranging in uh, between 14 uh, to a fact, uh, factor of six, meaning to say for one additional cost in regulation, you need, for example, 14 additional units of benefits, which is extremely large. And that's why economists are so much concerned about the regulatory environment for developing new ideas. Uh, now to summarize, so some of these challenges with respect to the farm and fork strategy are related to research and innovation, and their timing will be very important. And uh, another aspect is that um, in these uh, developments, we have to have 
a close link between the biomass that we are producing in its widest sense and the economic flows that are related to this. And that then relates also to the new business models that we basically need to develop to thrive on uh, the new policy uh, paradigms that are uh, currently under development. And in summary, this farm to fork in general is not new because this has always been how agriculture has been produced. You have primary crops that basically convert it and then reach uh, the consumers. But it's very important now with these new initiatives that we have a change in the mindset. So we change the focus of uh, uh, the whole uh, supply, uh, we change the focus towards the whole supply chain. And in particular, economic impact uh, factors become now even more important than they have been before. And for assessing, we have to really look at the opportunity cost. So what are we giving up? And this has been stressed by the previous speakers already to a large extent. Um, now for agriculture, so what are the new opportunities? There are a number. And they are very much linked to how do we develop these new supply chains. And that is where the initiatives have to focus on. And in particular, on the policy side, uh, there is uh, opportunity for supporting R&D, as well as to think about what are appropriate regulation for stimulating and generating uh, these new opportunities. Uh, with this, I'd like to finish my presentation and happy to take uh, questions and comments. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Wessler. Question and comments will arrive uh, after uh, you, you, you can stop sharing your screen now. Uh, thank you. And uh, questions and comments will arrive after the second presentation uh, that uh, will be delivered by Professor uh, Bojin Bojinov. Uh, I always want to remind that for the question, uh, the uh, point of reference in the chat is Asaka Nacional uh, and identify yourself and your affiliation when you ask a question. Uh, so uh, the next presentation is, uh, the title next presentation is the potential of genome editing to strengthen local food production uh, by Professor Bojin Bojinov of Agricultural University of Plovdiv. Um, uh, Professor Bojinov was two um, full terms Dean of the Faculty of Agronomy and served as Head of the Department of Genetics and Plant Breeding at the Agricultural University of Plovdiv, Bulgaria. I don't see him. Professor... Now I'm here. Uh, oh, perfect. Now I see you. Um, the, the research, uh, the, the, the Professor Bojinov's research focuses on the, the uh, available biodiversity in crop plants and domesticated animals, development of, uh, development of new plant varieties and use of remote sensing uh, technologies for data collection in plant breeding and crop production. Uh, your presentation is about genome editing and local food production. Uh, Professor Bojinov, you have the floor. Okay, thank you. Thank you for having me. And uh, <clears throat> I would like to also congratulate the organizers for this I would say a very diverse and uh, very uh, informative meeting. Uh, so what I was uh, about uh, to talk is the potential for the, uh, <clears throat> of the genome editing tools to strengthen local food production. But before going into uh, discussing this potential, I want to put it a little bit in context. And uh, that context is the context of a global tools that we use as uh, uh, breeders and as farmers to produce uh, novel plant varieties. Of course, animal, uh, species, uh, animal breeds also. But what the people have realized throughout the ages of domesticating plants and uh, uh, identifying new uh, plant forms and animal uh, forms is that uh, there are plenty of natural variations and those natural variations are there available for us to use so that if we make a proper use of it, we can gradually start modifying the characteristics of the plants and animals in a way that better suits our needs. And this, uh, these variations are so large and so interesting that you can see in a single progeny of a single plant how many different variants you can find. So that indicates that the, the genomes of the plants and of all living organisms are not something rigid and something uh, that is difficult to change or modify, 
but they are something very dynamic and very fluid. And while people are using throughout the ages this uh, fluidity of the genome and the dynamics of these genomes, they achieved modifying the plant architecture uh, significantly uh, in a way that better suits our needs. But it's not just the, the plant architecture, it's better. Um, <clears throat> uh, yeah, you can better view the, or see the, the differences in the plant architecture, but there are also market uh, changes in the plant constituents also. So the, the quality of the food, the digestibility of different types of food, et cetera, et cetera, were also modified. Unfortunately, that took uh, ages, so about 12,000 years uh, for agriculture to come with the more or less uh, varieties that uh, were developed by the middle of 20th century. Uh, and uh, because this within a species variation is, has some limits and the people are always looking to improve their product, they ended up with crossing different species, so unifying the genomes of different species so that they can produce new, um, new forms that better uh, suit their needs. And uh, there are some limitations even to this because sometimes you have a trait that you really want to have uh, transferred or uh, induced in your crop species but that trait does not exist within the, the available genomes of the crop species and it's available in some distant species that is not crossable to the crop species. And because the human ingenuity does have, does have no limits, so what people came up with about the middle of 20th century is to use the so-called bridge species, so species that would readily cross both with the wild uh, relative and with the crop species, the target crop species. So that way uh, they could transfer the trait first to the bridge species and then to the crop species. But with the knowledge of genetics uh, that was available by the mid 20th century, it was clear that all these uh, heritable uh, characteristics that we now call genes are carried by chromosomes and they could follow the chromosomes. But then it was clear that these chromosomes carry lots and lots of genes, hundreds, sometimes thousands of genes. And when you want to transfer this chromosome carrying these characteristics, you also transfer hundreds if not thousands of genes that you have no idea what they're doing. So to avoid that, uh, researchers came up with the idea, okay, we don't know these thousands of genes, we break the, the chromosome into multiple pieces and let the magic of uh, uh, <coughs> Uh, dynamicity and fluidity of the genome, uh, integrate these pieces of the chromosome into different spots of the crop um, genome, and then start selecting the plants that result out of this, or looking for the ones that carry the trait. Of course, uh, that meant that uh, we are targeting one single gene, but, uh, or one single characteristic, but we are transferring hundreds if not thousands of other uh, genes uh, and characteristics that either we don't know what they are related to or uh, we straight away don't want to. But the technology by that time was uh, very, uh, proved very useful and uh, since the 1950s, uh, as you can see, more than 3,200 uh, new varieties were developed by using such technology and similar ones. And most of these varieties were developed by public institutions. I need to stress on that. Uh, and if you study these varieties, you will realize that there are uh, market, uh, markedly different modifications to the genomes that were done by this uh, breaking and relinking of the segments of the genome. Pieces of, the, of DNA were getting lost. Pieces of DNA were getting introduced into the genome. There were shifts from place to place, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. Uh, and uh, all these uh, various changes of the DNA of the genome of the target crop finally would um, be <clears throat> made to produce uh, products that are nowadays on our shelves in the supermarket that prove very useful for the consumer. Uh, so, what is the important part is that, that in, at this time we are moving very often thousands of genes with, without knowing what these genes are doing, whether they are changed somehow, where did they get inserted into the genome, but all that technology was unregulated and it still produced very nice results. 
Of course, with the development of our knowledge in genetics, we were able to gradually narrow down the, the genes or the specific segments of the genome that are responsible for specific traits that we want uh, to improve in our crops. And by 1980s, we already came to the technology that allowed us to uh, purify only the, the segment of the hereditary material that carries the trait that we are interested in. And then we use different uh, technologies to insert that specific small piece of DNA into the genome of our uh, species. And then the technology at that time was not very precisely working. So this insertion was going into some random places in the genome. And then we start selecting from the one that uh, is uh, at the right place and functioning uh, at, uh, at the right rate that we want to. Uh, however, what happened with that technology, which is based on the same logic uh, as like for a thousand years, but much more precise because we only move either one or very few very well characterized genes, but then came the system of regulating this technology that is so complicated, so prohibitive that now uh, nowadays makes it almost um, unaccessible for most public institutions. So they basically cannot use this technology in Europe to develop uh, new varieties, most of the public institutions. And in the rest of the world, this technology has brought various products targeted at various uh, markets with uh, various specific um, properties that were, that were identified and then came to the market to meet the market demands for these needs. I'm, I'm not going to go into details, it's just a few examples here. Uh, with the further development of our knowledge of how the genome is functioning, we were able to further develop the technology of delivering the pieces of DNA or the genetic material, not just at some random places, but at very precise location within the genome. That started with the development of uh, a set of tools for uh, what was called already genome editing. And the first set of tools were, was based on protein DNA binding uh, specificity. I'm not going into details, but uh, it became uh, clear that this is a bit too complicated to use all these tools because you have to express, you have to have different proteins in your cells uh, to do the recognition of the region that you are interested in. So in the early 2000s or about 2010, uh, we started using the RNA, DNA, the nucleic acid, nucleic, nucleic acid binding specificity, which is much more specific, much more easier to use. And there are new tools now coming uh, for use by the leaders. The most famous one is the CRISPR-Cas9 system, which uses the specificity of binding a small piece of RNA to the, our genomic DNA region, which uh, RNA, when finds the specific place in the DNA that we're interested in, uh, associated protein that uh, is uh, coming together with the RNA cuts the DNA at that specific spot and then we can insert there the sequences or the genomic region or whatever uh, gene or property we want to introduce into the genome. Of course, uh, with the current regulations, as soon as you start inserting uh, foreign DNA, you come under the prohibitive cost of re regulatory regime that doesn't allow <coughs> public institution in Europe to actually use it for the benefits of farmers or consumers uh, to propose products that can easily um, enter the market. And that led the scientists to develop further technology so, uh, so that with our current knowledge that in fact we very often don't need to introduce foreign DNA. For example, if we have some resistance for some disease as was uh, commented by previous presenters, that is a big problem. Uh, we can just modify the sequence or the allele of our crop so that we can uh, convert the susceptibility allele to the, uh, to the resistance allele. And what are the two projects we are working now with, uh, with our team? One problem is uh, for the local mountain barleys that are suffering for the last few years by the so-called net blotch disease. This is the pest that's causing it. We have no resistant varieties in Bulgaria. Uh, so what we ask uh, from various gene banks is to get the resistant or tolerant genotypes. And then we started studying the gen so-called genome-wide association studies to 
to look for the resistance cosine and the intentions we are now at this stage. The intentions is to convert uh, our susceptibility alleles in our varieties into the resistant alleles uh, for, for this disease, specifically for this disease. And the other project we are working in on is the improving of the antioxidant contents. This is a project targeted more at the end user. Uh, our local varieties have various uh, properties, various colors and shapes, um, and they have various antioxidant molecules produced in them. Um, but we have an increasing demand, especially now with the COVID crisis. Uh, people have reduced their, their mobility, not just international, but also inside the country. And that led to uh, having them look for more local varieties with better properties, especially if they can claim and it health benefits. So what we did is do the metabolomic study, the different various metabolites in different varieties, and uh, already identified what are the differences, which ones have higher carotenoids, uh, higher polyphenolics, et cetera, et cetera. And we are now at identifying the loci responsible for this increased antioxidant content in our local varieties. And the aim is to pyramid these antioxidants into improved genotypes by genome editing, by converting the alleles. That's more or less the idea of how we intend to use these technologies to improve uh, in strength of local food production. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Bajinov. Um, I, I, I get back the floor, I take back the floor because we have um, now the Q&A session, uh, 10 minutes more or less, let's say. Uh, we have um, questions that uh, are more on, 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 the, on, the, on the farm side, but maybe I will call it back all the other, all, all the panelists to, to, to say something. So uh, the first question is, uh, I will ask, uh, I will ask to you is, is uh, from Marie Cecile, it's about a, a kind of marketing approach. Maybe uh, Professor Vesler, I don't know if you want to, 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 to reply. Um, she says, uh, it looks like that the European Commission's objectives are to meet EU consumer demands more than non-European consumer demands. Isn't this a marketing approach that could reconnect farmers with consumers in Europe? So, uh, could it be the, op an opportunity for European farmers to improve their image in society? Professor Wessler yeah. first, and then I will call also yeah. Max Schulman because, uh, because we uh, is, is waiting also, uh, is, his point of view as a farmer is important in this respect. Yes, uh, I think it's a relevant question and um, that basically is one of the uh, objectives of the farm to fork strategy to increase trust in the uh, uh, food supply system within the European Union. As previous speakers have already pointed out, Europe perhaps is a country that provides the highest quality of food based on, uh, let's say, uh, quantitative data related to uh, residues, it, it, uh, limits, etc. Uh, we still have a debate about the uh, quality of the food production system, whether or not this is right, rightly or not so, we have this debate and with the farm to, uh, farm to fork strategy, the objective is to increase this trust. Will this generate new opportunities uh, for farmers? Uh, maybe, uh, I think they, they can, uh, depending on what farmers are doing, they might uh, have the possibility to increase their uh, uh, links with uh, direct consumers. And through this, you, uh, what we often observe, you can increase uh, revenues. So we observe um, direct sellings of farms to uh, uh, consumers using information communication technologies. Um, rent your cow. Uh, rent your sheep, rent your uh, chick, etc. And um, these are opportunities. But on a larger scale, uh, they may also be a, li a little bit limited and not be a general solution. Thank you, Professor Wesler. I'd like to hear from uh, 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 Max Schulman on that. If, if she is if still with us, Max. 
uh, as a farmer, do you think that the, the EU Farm to Fork can be an opportunity, uh, let's say, from a, from a marketing point of view, of reconnection between farmers and, and consumers? Thank you. It's a very good question, and I really hope so. I think that this better informed citizens part of the Farm to Fork will play an important role, as long as we can use it the right way. Like I already pointed out, uh, I think that we have somehow been floating away from each other, the consumers and the farmers or the society and the civil society and the farmers. There is not enough understanding anymore since we are a fairly small bunch of people practicing and feeding Europe. So I hope that this will bring us closer together. This for sure needs to build up the trust, like it has been said here quite a bit many times before by the previous speakers. And also it needs to be explained in maybe a different way, not only how we produce food, but how we are part of, for instance, the carbon cycle, how we are part of the nutrition cycle. And I hope that utilizing now the farm to fork, since it has been put into a more of a legislative package, we will be able to penetrate into the citizens better. So I put a lot of trust into it, but that also means that we all have to be open-minded. Not only we as farmers to show what we are doing and tell what we are doing like today, I also hope that the citizens as a whole also would look at it from a positive perspective, at least after COVID-19, that yes, we can survive, we can feed Europe. And the thing is also, we as farmers, we have been developing our way of farming for centuries, like we already heard some plant breeding programs. I mean, to get to what we have today, you're talking about thousands of years. We also have been developing our farming a long time. So we are following all the time the trends, new technologies, as much as we just have the possibility to use to be able to become more resilient, more sustainable, and produce even more nutrition and healthy and safe food for all the citizens. Thank you, Max. Um, I will pick up another question. This is from uh, um, this is from this is for the for the scientists actually. Yeah. From uh, um, uh, so the first question is for uh, uh, Professor Bojinov. Um, what future do you see for NBTs and NGTs? So these are uh, new, new breeding techniques and new genetic techniques, I think, I think, in the EU, given the European Court of Justice ruling in 2018. Uh, yes, Professor Boshinov, and then I, I, I ask another question to both uh, Professor Wesler and, and Professor Boshinov. Uh, yes, what we need is uh, really to um, start um, less randomly or undiscriminately use the so-called precautionary principle because that's what hurdles uh, mostly the research. Uh, it's not the, the, the actual risks that uh, are coming from these technologies because as I explained in the presentation, these technologies are essentially nothing new. They are just gradual development of our ability to better and more precise manipulate the genetic material of the crops and uh, animals. So, uh, in fact, we have a misunderstanding between the politicians and the general society, and that's the problem that we have to solve by better conveying our messages, that the new breeding techniques are essentially uh, a gradual development of the technologies that we already have. In fact, uh, mutation breeding that I was talking about in the 1950s, that was the new breeding technique at the time. Then it was the genetic engineering in the 1980s. That was the new breeding technique at the time. Now is the genome editing is the new breeding technique. So we always have a new breeding techniques because researchers are trying always to provide better tools, new tools, more precise tools. Uh, so whether the legislature, legislators will um, uh, react better to this understanding and uh, acquire it or comprehend it better, uh, is also a matter of uh, whether this new farm to fork uh, strategy will work together with the uh, <clears throat> biodiversity strategy. We need to produce more variation and we need to produce it faster uh, and more efficiently because as was said in other presentations, the, the population, world population is growing. In fact, 
uh, the calculations show that we, in the next 25 years, we will have to produce as a humanity as much food as we produced in the last 12,000 years. And it's only possible by using these new techniques. So if the EU uh, puts a blind eye on these new techniques, uh, it will just uh, become, as we, we are talking between ourselves, a museum of agriculture. Now we need a quick uh, reaction, quick re reply from uh, your, uh, your side, uh, uh, Professor Boginov, and from uh, uh, Jusus uh, Wessler, because I have, uh, I have a very easy question. Uh, are there any real opportunities in the farm-to-fork uh, farm uh, uh, um, uh, for the EU science? Um, is there, is there, uh, what, what are the opportunities for, for science and research? Is there, is there a real, uh, uh, how can I say, is there a real vision for the future for research and science uh, as, as a part of, of, of uh, the, uh, the food system? Who wants to ask first, Professor Boginov or Professor Wessler? Well, uh, I would say that uh, I don't see the, the strategy, the two strategies very coherent with each other and with the overall view, uh, let's say with the strategy of Horizon, the former Horizon 2020, now the um, Horizon Europe program. Uh, so they need still to, to work more on integrating the different views of how the things will develop. We have large uh, research budgets, budgets in Europe, but uh, like the, the three strategies are not very coherent uh, for the moment. So I, I think they still need to, to be worked together. Professor Wessler. Um, yes, definitely there's a very important role for uh, science. So um, we need new solutions, otherwise we wouldn't have a problem, right? And um, the question, and that is the issue, is how coherent are basically the strategies? And then what, what Professor Bougin was, was already pointing out. And I think that is one of the big challenges, to make a coherent strategy out of the different strategies that we at this point in time have, to really provide solutions that are long-lasting. Thank you, Professor Wessler. I would now move to the final remarks because um, because we have also uh, to to repeat the uh, initial exercise on uh, with our poll. Um, so, um, uh, as promised, I, I invite the host to launch the poll again. Uh, it's very easy to take part in the in the survey. And uh, I'll, I'll remind the, the question, which of the targets of farm to fork and biodiversity strategy will be the most challenging to achieve in your view? Uh, uh, people are voting, but uh, yes, we are still, uh, uh, come on, we are more than 40 participants right now. So we have, uh, we have, uh, how many, it's almost, it's almost, it's not yet 50%. So 10 seconds and I will close the, the, the poll. Oh, the poll is closed already. So uh, thanks to, <laughs> to Jose Maria Castilla. Uh, the, okay. 50% reduction. So the, the, the most challenging uh, target is the 50% reduction in uh, uh, plant product, uh, protection products. Uh, it was 61% at the beginning. Um, the 25% uh, the, um, for 25% the, the organic uh, target is the most challenging. It was, uh, no, sorry, the for 14%, it was 15%. Uh, so sorry, I, 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 I made a bit of confusion. Um, so the number two has increased actually. Now it's 79%. Uh, some of the, the uh, number one has decreased, is 14. The number three has decreased because uh, it is zero right now. And the four, uh, fourth target, the reduction nutrient loss, uh, meaning that, you know, decrease 20% uh, in the fertilizer uses. It was 12%, now it's 7%. So uh, the, the, the greatest concern in the, in the audience is about 
the uh, plant protection products. Um, and it seems that the presentations have reinforced this, uh, this view. Uh, thank you. Uh, I will move now to the final remarks. Um, I will try to, to sum up a very uh, diverse, very diverse contributions that uh, came from uh, uh, from farmers like uh, uh, Max, Max Schulman that gave us the, a real perception of, of the trade-offs and 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 the, in, uh, and the impact that the the uh, the strategies could have if we had no alternative. So the important, the importance to have in the toolbox of the farmer other, 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 other tools than um, PPPs or fertilizers and so on. Um, uh, and then uh, uh, we had Pedro Gallardo that uh, reminded us um, what is the situation also on, on the field and on the farm. I uh, was quite impressed by, by this uh, definition of the Southern Europe as a laboratory for uh, foreign pests, in a sense, exotic pests. And uh, there is so much research needed. Uh, something has been done, but it's really one of the front lines and one of the um, major constraints in the, in the next years. Um, and then we had Deborah Piovan, um, excellent presentation because uh, she makes the facts and perceptions and the, the, uh, the importance of uh, establishing a new uh, contact with consumers, a new trust with consumers. And then we had uh, Justus Westler that uh, gave us a, a wide economic perspective. Let's say uh, uh, it was the title was uh, the economic impact of the two strategies, but uh, but we had this in a, in a, in a very extensive way, um, and so uh, it, it allowed us to to reflect to uh, the link between innovation regulation, and this brings us back to demand in a sense to the um, uh, to the perception of consumers. Um, and the demand, one of the trends of the demand, is also the localization that is different than uh, localism, I would say, I would uh, underline. And uh, uh, with the final presentation from uh, uh, Professor Bozhinov, we had uh, uh, some, we, we, we could see some examples about how, how a, a, the, the, the avant-garde, let's say, genomic techniques could be useful for, uh, um, for local production, for strengthening local production. Um, before giving the final, floor uh, to, uh, to, to, uh, to uh, Jose Maria uh, Castilla. Um, I want to thank all the panelists. I want to thank all the participants. We, had, uh, we could not answer all the questions. Uh, sorry for that. Um, and uh, what to say, we have talked mostly of targets, okay? And the targets are there. For some, the targets are uh, unbearable constraints and uh, uh, they are impossible to achieve. For some others, they are not sufficient. Uh, we, the EU food system must strive for more. Um, for me as a journalist, they are interesting because um, in a media perspective, the targets stimulate the debate. But I find also that we can't stop there. We can't stop to the targets. Uh, the debate is too serious and complex to remain uh, at these simplified levels because the targets are quite simplistic uh, and, and, and uh, let's say more than, uh, they, they, they are political tools, uh, political communication tools rather than analytical tools in this case. So um, I think we, we should not remain at that and uh, always take into greater account the facts on the ground, uh, on the farm, I would say, and the scientific evidence. And with that, I uh, pass the floor to Jose Maria Castiglia for the final remarks. Thank you, everybody. Hello, Angelo. Hello to everyone again. Thank you so much for your amazing job. I know that sometimes it's complicated to be on time in every single panel, but you, you, it was amazing. Thank you again. I want to express also my gratitude to all the panelists uh, because without you, this, this network not make sense. So thank you again. And also to, to the participants. They, they, they launch a lot of interesting questions. That's true that we don't have enough time to answer 
all of them. But um, if you are agree, I'm going to share these questions too with all of the panelists, and we can replay it later. Second one, I, uh, or first one, I want to encourage to all the participants to visit our website. I think that this is interesting way to to have a real contact with us and and to see the five priorities that we launch for the new European Commission and European Parliament. And remember, as we mentioned at the beginning of the, the webinar, we are going to share all the presentation with all of the participants. And also, we are going to, 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 build, to update our website with a, with a video of this interesting webinar. Finally, uh, I want to, to finish my, my speak with, with one important idea. This is the freedom of choice. Um, we need to say that different models of agriculture can coexist, coexist in the EU. Organic production, conventional farming, and biotech crops together represents the genuine EU model of agriculture. One solution does not fit all. So farmers need to have the possibility to choose which model they, what they want according to the market, to the business orientation, to agronomic challenge, profitability, and cost. Once again, thank you so much to, to participate in this webinar, and I hope to see you soon at the end of the year, probably in December. We are going to organize our annual event of the Farmer Scientist Network in the European Parliament. Okay, see you and have a nice day. Bye bye.